JavaScript is one of those cool languages um, that sort of no one really noticed for a long time. It was, it was launched in 1995. It was Netscape 2 Beta 3. That's almost 14 years ago, which is pretty astonishing, really. I sort of I don't think of JavaScript as being over a decade old, but it is. Um, interestingly enough, two months, three months after JavaScript launched, Ruby launched as well. Um, the first public release um, in February of 1996. And I sort of remember at the time being a lot more interested in Ruby than JavaScript. Um, but that changed. And that's why I'm here. Um, and we all know the, the history, um, or I hope we all know the history, the sort of naming kerfuffle inside Netscape, you know, live wire, and all sorts of, or live, something like that, all sorts of naming problems. Um, and the reason why the name JavaScript came about, of course, is because of the big sun launch of Java at the same time and Java's appearance in the browser. Um, for my purposes, that actually sort of suits me. Um, if you look at the, the, the history of JavaScript and how it's come to where it is, I sort of equate it to point cast and RSS. Um, for those of you that don't know or don't remember, point cast was this like crazy screensaver that took news syndication feeds and displayed them. Um, as it turned out, it wasn't a very good business. Um, displaying advertising while someone's away from their computer doesn't attract that many advertisers. But, um, but here's the thing. Um, it, it introduced the idea of news syndication. It sort of got us thinking about that. And RSS came along and, and won. It was an open standard. The web decided that that was the way it should be. And I sort of see the same thing with JavaScript and Java. The, the web has decided that JavaScript is the answer. Um, so if we think about you know, what JavaScript's role was for a long time, you know, it had a single domain. It was a web page. That was it. And, um, and, and that was it. You know, Java had the dancing duke, and JavaScript gave us mouse overs and pop-ups. That's, that's what we wanted at the time. Um, and that didn't really change until 1999 when XML HTTP request came along. Thank you, Microsoft, every now and again. Um, but no one really noticed until Gmail and, uh, and Google Maps, of course. But Around that time, I'd been working with JavaScript on the server, or not necessarily the server, but not in a browser for quite a while. I'd been working for a company called Fatango in London. We'd been building, um, or I'd been building, sort of workflow tools to join together REST services. And the thing about workflow tools is workflow's lovely until something goes wrong, and then all of a sudden you need to make a decision. And you can't really do that without some sort of decision-making tool, a programming language. And so I was embedding JavaScript in all sorts of stuff. And then a little bit later on, Fatango was looking for a new product. And we launched this thing called Zimkey. It was uh, probably the first platform as a service out there um, way before anyone was ready for it. And I spent a lot of the next couple of years talking about how JavaScript on the server side made a lot of sense. And everyone looked at me as if I was crazy. Um, and, and that's changed. So the, I, I called this. Slide rise and fall. It's actually rise and fall and rise again. Um, just don't have that much room. So in, um, in uh, 2007, Zimkey had sort of vanished. Um, I moved back to Canada from London. Um, I was tired of London, really. It gets tiresome, big city. Um, and anyway, I'd moved to my mountain retreat. And I found myself with some time on my hands. Um, and I had a whole bunch of ideas, and I wanted to implement them. So I, you know, I did what everyone else was doing at the time and is doing now for the large part. And I picked up a copy of Ruby and you know, browsed through the, rail, you know, the Rails documentation and started to hack the ideas together. And what I found was it was actually really painful. Um, you know, for, for, for everything that everyone says about Ruby, oh, it's wonderful, blah, 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 blah. You know, I actually found it really painful. And, and one of the reasons I found it painful was because I'd come from this world where I could write almost everything I wanted in JavaScript. Um, so while I, was, while I was trying to hack these ideas together, I was using Git. Um, Git had sort of come up at the same time. And I sort of you know, 
out of that, those experiments, I realized that actually Git was what I wanted to deploy things into the cloud. It was such a wonderful tool. I could just push things. Um, and that gave rise to a company I started with a colleague who's here, Brian, um, called Reasonably Smart in June of last year, um, which was JavaScript on the server side, a managed platform as a service, you deploy with Git. But to understand why this is timely, you really have to understand why a platform as a service is a timely idea. And it's about economics and commoditization. That line was supposed to be earlier. So um, this is my f a former colleague of mine, Simon Wardley. Um, he actually does a really great talk about these ideas about commoditization, about economics. If you haven't had the opportunity to see him speak, do so. Um, it's well worth it. And if you don't ever get the chance, his talks are all over the web. It's easy to find. Uh, Simon Wortley. Um, so one of Simon's big themes in his talk is pointing out that electricity was once really hot technology. Like it was, it was a competitive advantage to have electricity in your factory. Um, but these days, we don't really think about it. We have wall sockets. We plug stuff in. Electricity comes out. And we don't care where it comes from or why it comes from there or how they generate it, for the most part. I mean, there's a slight movement now to want green electricity. But let's face it, when we plug something into the wall, all we care about is that electricity comes out in the same format. But it wasn't always the case, as I mentioned. Um, the place where electricity as a public utility first started was this little town called Godalming in Surrey in the UK. It's a tiny little town. And to drive through it these days, you really wouldn't think that it was sort of the center of the world in 1881, um, but it was. Um, a, a company started providing electricity to the entire town. And it was, it was fantastic. They had street lights, no more gas. It was awesome. And then they had a big flood. Um, <laughs> And in 1884, they basically bailed, and no electricity came back to Godalming until 1904. But in the meantime, what was happening was a sort of rise of all these public utilities, public utility power generators. They were popping up left, right, and center. And by 1926, there were 600 of them in the UK. Um, thing was, they all operated on different standards, different frequencies, AC, DC, you name it. And in 1926, that what changed was the Central Electricity Board was set up in the UK. And it fixed all of that. It standardized what the output should be. It, um, it standardized how you would get electricity out of a wall. It standardized AC over DC, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the thing is, this, you know, factories up until this point hadn't really changed. For years, they'd been generating all the sort of motion they needed with steam engines. And these Great big steam engines had engineers on site. Um, they had their fuel on site. They shoveled coal into a burner, which heated up the water, which spun a flywheel, which drove a belt, which drove all the machines in the factory. Um, and the steam engine had really revolutionized industry, changed it completely, in much the same way that sort of having a server changed the way we do computing, rather than going to a mainframe. Um, and the sort of non-mechanized factory had vanished. They had all been sort of you know, competed out of existence. Um, the thing was, when the steam engine broke down, the engineers who were on site all of a sudden had to get their stuff together. Um, you know, they took the blame, they pulled an all-nighter, sorted it out, the factory was running the next morning. It sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> um, we've all sort of done those as, as programmers, as engineers. Um, we've all had the situation where something's gone horrendously wrong and we need to sort it out. Um, and, and that's something that's starting to change now. And that's something that starts to change with a platform as a service. Just as when electricity from a public utility started changing factories from the steam engine to machines that could be bought off the shelf and plugged into a wall, or the proverbial shelf. Um, the, the, the um, platform as a service is changing how we deploy and manage our software. Um, no more engineers on site. No more steam engines on site. Um, and cloud really means the same thing about computing. We just you know, don't have to shovel coal anymore. Now, often people think cloud. They think things like EC2. Uh, and that's, a, you know, that's probably one of the first things that pops into people's head. But that still means managing machines. and we can do better. Um, and what we can do is platform as a service. 
we don't want to and shouldn't have to want to um, to worry about scale or managing individual machines or patching security or you know, figuring out how many database servers or app servers we need and then load balancing all of those things. Those are, those are things that give us no competitive advantage whatsoever. We just, you know, everyone has to do it. There's no point in us doing it. And with things like EC2, you're still having to do that. You're still having to consider that. You're still having to make those decisions, spin up machines, tear them back down again. Um, so with a platform as a service, and specifically with a smart platform, you write your code, you push it to the cloud with Git, and it just runs. Um, you pay for only, only for what you use, and I don't mean like a small subscription such as EC2. I mean genuinely when something's used, you pay for it, and when it's not, you don't. Um, metered billing, much like electricity. So I'm not suggesting that there is no place for having a server or a data center of your own. What I'm saying is that they're going to slowly disappear. And maybe they'll never vanish. In fact, I'm sure they'll never vanish. But for the majority of us, we don't need to be doing that stuff. It gives us no benefit. So really, it's a matter of economics. It's an inevitability. Whether you like it or not, if you're managing your servers, for the most part, it's costing you money that you just don't need to spend. Um, but why JavaScript? Coming back to the theme of the day. Well, to me, it just sort of makes sense. Um, Let's look at JavaScript's sort of commonplace in the world. It's in the browser. It has the DOM. It's got great libraries for the browser, like jQuery and Prototype and all Dojo, all those sort of things. Um, hope I got everyone there. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. The DOM sucks. We all know it. That's why we have these libraries. But it doesn't have to be on the server. And in fact, it's not on the server. The DOM is just something that the Mozilla engineers and the IE engineers and the Safari guys expose into the JavaScript space. Um, in and of itself, JavaScript is simple and it's beautiful. And, and I don't need to tell you that, I hope. We all know JavaScript. That's why we're here. Um, and the strange thing is, everyone else knows that too. Everyone not in this room. Almost every internal IT shop these days has given up the sort of desktop app as a paradigm. What they're doing is they're writing web applications. If they're writing web applications, then chances are, in fact, I'd almost say it's guaranteed that they've got people in that shop that know JavaScript. Um, and if you think about JavaScript on the server, it means you're not context switching all the time. You're not switching between Perl or Python or Ruby and JavaScript. You're just going back and forth between the server and the client, and it doesn't really matter. And that gives you code reuse as well. So there are two other sneaky reasons why JavaScript's going to win. Um, the first is that it's where the money is. Uh, Trace Monkey and V8 and Space Needle or Squirrel Fish or whatever they're calling it. Um, there's, there's loads of money being spent on making these things really, really fast. And I'd say if you look at Ruby and, uh, the, and Python and Perl and all the other dynamic languages, over the sort of 10, 15 years of their development, they've had less time and focus spent on actually pushing the boundaries of what you can do with a dynamic language compared to JavaScript, which has only really had that time and energy and focus in the last two or three years, let's say. Um, it's really incredible how far JavaScript has come in a really short time. Um, there's another sneaky reason from a platform provider perspective, and that is that JavaScript does nothing. Out of the box, there's no I.O., there's no IPC, there's no threads, there's no process management. It does nothing. Um, it's Turing complete, but can't do much with it unless you tell it it can do something. So as, a, as an embedder of the language in, a, in an environment where I'm not vetting all the code, I can pretty much guarantee that you can't do anything bad. So there's a lot of good reasons for JavaScript in a platform as a service. Um, so you know, I am here from Joint. They're paying for me to be here. So let's talk about the smart platform specifically. Um, it's utility build, like I said. You pay only for what you use. Um, you build your app, you deploy it to the cloud with Git, and that's it. The key point and the differentiating point, I think, is that you can move away if you want. The entire stack is open source. The platform's open source. There's no lock-in. If you don't like what we're doing or how we're doing it, you can take it and run it on your own machines. We think we'll do a better job than you. That's all we're saying. Um, so. In London, there's a term that we use to describe all the sort of stuff that 
you have to do to run a web app. It's called the act shaving. Um, and the idea is that for all, you know, you wake up in the morning, you want a cup of coffee, you, uh, you find you don't have any milk. So you go to the store to get some milk and you find you don't have any money. So you go to the ATM, you put your card in, you get the money out, you go back to the store, you go get, get the milk, you take it back home, you make your cup of coffee. And really all that other stuff, other than making the cup of coffee, for the good it was doing you, you might as well have been shaving a yak. That's where the phrase comes from. Um, but that's how I think of what we're doing with a platform. We're taking away the need for you to worry about all those, all the yak shaving. I was going to say something really rude there. Um, yeah, we're just, we're, just meaning, we're just making it so you don't need to worry about it. So, you know, like I said, adding removing machines, load balancing, data storage, multi-data center, um, having to worry about backups, caching, data storage, all that sort of stuff. It just does the right thing without developer interaction. And it's because we can abstract away behind what's going on inside the, JV, uh, the JavaScript virtual machine. I nearly said JVM there. Um, this slide isn't all that interesting, but it does let me bring up a point that I actually saw someone Twitter or tweet or whatever the verb is this week. Um, yesterday, after the Axiom stack talk, um, which was about performance, um, and someone saying, you know, really, is JavaScript faster than PHP? Uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, my answer is yes. And if you, really, if you really find a way that it isn't, wait a couple of weeks, and it will be faster. It's just going to happen. Um, all, that, all that money being spent means yes. Um, so as an absolute statistic, um, with JavaScript contexts in SpiderMonkey, I can create 797, 797 of them a second, and that's in serial, a single thread, uh, spinning them up and tearing them down. So yes, it's fast. Um, anyway, so here's the simplest piece of software that runs on the smart cloud. It's really simple. It's going to spit out hello world to the requesting browser. Not much to it, really. Um, I think we can all understand what it's doing there. Um, it's a function called main. It takes a request object. It returns the response. That's it. Um, here's another version. This is just demonstrating e for x. e for x is super cool. Um, it makes XML first class objects, if you don't know, um, inside JavaScript. Uh, then given that object, you can actually walk through the tree. It's awesome. Um, it has its problems as well, some weird things. But for the most part, it's great. Um, and here's a slightly more complex main function. It's returning uh, more, a more uh, specific HTTP response. You can see how you could build up almost any response you'd want. The really interesting thing about all of those three functions is that they scale. Um, you can make one request, or you can make 100 million requests through the smart platform, and it will scale, and you've done nothing to make it scale. Every, all that effort is taken place beyond the scenes. Now, yes, I know that you could write a PHP app or a Ruby app or a Python or whatever app that scaled because it just doesn't do that much, but you'd have to worry about the number of machines. You'd have to worry about all the load balancing and stuff that goes on with that with the smart platform. You don't. Um, it doesn't matter one hit or a billion hits a second, it'll scale. So this is the contents of the request object. It's got all the stuff that you'd find in an HTTP request. You can dig out. And I've, I've omitted the headers because they kind of took up all the slide and tiny font and bad. Um, so the, the body and the content are in there, uh, the query string, pretty much everything, the URI, of course. Um, the, uh, the type is an interesting one. We're going to make it so that you can request, uh, make requests into the platform through XMPP or through SMTP or almost anything. Basically, if we can figure out a way to hook it up, we'll send a request in, and you'll be able to serve stuff from it. Um, but the question you're probably all asking yourself is, how do you make stuff like data storage and all that work? Well, we, like I said, we extend JavaScript. So a couple of examples here. Read, write, search, remove. You don't have a huge um, API into the data storage system, but if you're working with things like Active Record, you don't have that big of an API into that either. It's abstracted away from you. So this really lets you take advantage of the fact that we can introspect objects. We can we control the line between JavaScript space and the uh, and the actual data storage layer 
pretty completely. Uh, we can make decisions as to how to store it and why to store it in a certain way and you know, how you're going to query it later on, all that sort of stuff. We can introspect on the wire and take care of it for you. Um, so the API, while it looks quite small, does everything you need it to, and it scales. Um, similarly, HTTP requests out. Um, that gives you a response which looks much like the response you would return from your main function. Um, blah, 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 blah. Uh, there's not much to say about that. It's just sort of interesting because it's in there. Um, uh, that's synchronous. You're on the server. Um, we're going to, so as part of, I'll, I'll mention it later on again, but as part of what we're doing, we're going to have asynchronous workers on the, on the server. So if you wanted to make it asynchronous, you could. It's just that it's out of band from the rest of the request as well. Um, you can always cache it and pull it out in a synchronous request. Um, so there's a bunch of other extensions, stuff that you probably wouldn't want to implement in JavaScript. Um, yeah, HMAC, SHA-1, that sort of stuff. Um, JavaScript not so good at uh, binary. Um, there's also a media store, so dumping large content items, similar to how you would treat S3 remotely. Um, you just put stuff in, you get stuff out. It's easy. Um, but the thing is, and importantly, you don't want to do everything yourself. So we're including a bunch of libraries. We're trying where possible to find these libraries that third parties have written. We've written some ourselves. Um, so templating, um, there's an application framework, um, whatever that means. Uh, JSON parsing beyond just a val and JSON stringification, that sort of string encoding. Uh, there's a great library called Date.js, which does all sorts of crazy formatting on dates. Um, and wiki markup, which sort of brings me to the next slide, because I'm going to write or demonstrate the writing of a wiki. Um, so I'm going to use a couple of libraries in this. There's um, the Sammy library, which is named Sammy sort of half sarcastically after Sammy Davis Jr., because it looks a lot like the Sinatra framework for Ruby. Um, and there's the um, the resource library, which sort of takes the data store which is there and just wraps it in some nicer, nicer stuff, as you can see in the next line down, which is creating a sort of page, page namespace for objects. Um, so here's my first function. It's not as complicated as it looks. I'm giving it a regular expression as the first argument, um, and the second argument is a function that will execute when the machine takes a request, a get request, um, that matches that regex. So that regex will match slash and anything after slash, basically. So typical wiki style page names. Um, if, there's not, if it just matches the slash and there's nothing else after it, it goes to, it's loading the home page. Um, it tries to get the page out of the data store. If that fails, it'll throw an exception. It just create a fake one. Um, and it returns a template that sort of mobs that all up and dumps it out to the browser in the pretty form. Um, and so there's another library usage there, the wiki library, that just does some wiki markup conversion. And it wiki markup converts the, the content of that object and spits it out to the template. Um, so wiki, need to be able to edit it, sort of the point. Um, if it finds a slash edit at the end of one of those URLs, then it pulls up an editor page. Again, if it doesn't have a page name, it looks for, actually, that's a kind of misline, because I take care of that later on. Um, doesn't matter. So again, try and get the page out of the data store. You return the template that is the editor. And if you don't have the page name, or if you don't have the page, then just redirect to slash, go back to the home page. Someone was trying to do something bad. Um, saving, again, similar to Sinatra. We're d dealing with a post, um, a post to the page name. Take the page as the first argument as the function. That's that, that's, so I should probably explain that a little better. That a page variable that is the first argument to the function is actually the capture from the regex pulled out, and it goes in order of the name of the captures. So if you had more than one capture, put more than one argument, you can get the data out like that. Um, it ignores the first 
sort of this is everything I was matching against response of a regular expression match. Um, so anyway, get the page out. If you don't have it, create a new one. Set up the ID. If you do have it, or either way, dump the content in, save it, and then redirect back to it. It's really quite simple. Um, and that's a wiki. That's, that's everything. It works. Um, there's some HTML template -y type code, but that's pretty much it. Um, again, the, the point here with this is that in none of that code have I gone out of my way to make it, you know, quote unquote, scalable. I'm not really worrying about that at all. I'm not um, writing to a, a memcache first. I'm not doing anything clever. I'm not writing to a message queue to save the page at a date so I'm not blocking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm doing nothing particularly sensible um, for a large scale app. Not, a, not that I'm suggesting that this wiki will ever be a large scale app. But, but if it was, I wouldn't have to worry about it because the, the platform's taking care of it all. It's going to make it scale. Just like the initial main function, all that stuff in there, the performance should remain constant no matter what. So I think that's pretty cool. I've spent most of my career um, sort of trying to make things scale. And what you find is that as time goes by, most of your application is taken up with code to make things scale rather than sort of the business logic, the functionality that makes you different. Um, and so yeah, I, I like the fact I don't need to worry about that. Um, we've got a lot of things that we're going to add to the core offering. Um, work queues were one that I mentioned to make it if you want to do asynchronous stuff. Um, scheduled execution is another one. You know, I want to run, I want to run this at one o'clock every morning or every ten minutes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, more libraries, that was a, a big point. Um, XMPP and SMTP I mentioned as well. I'd love to get video encoding in there. One extension I didn't mention that we have is you know image manipulation, flip, rotate, crop, blah blah blah. Um, you have to be able to do that these days, apparently. Um, video, if we could do the same with video, we're not far off. It's actually, the big problem with video is making it possible to have a downloadable version that just works because of all the libraries that are involved. Um, so just to sort of summarize where we are, um, we're just a short way away from release. Originally when, um, well, originally this had been live and running and then when Joint bought Reasonably Smart, and we renamed it to the Smart Platform instead. Um, that's the difference between Canadians and Americans, I guess. Um, um, the, yeah, we, so it was renamed the Smart Platform. We actually took it offline because we wanted to focus on getting it right before we released it to the world. So very, very shortly, you'll be able to download a, a desktop version. You'll be able to check the source out of Git. You'll, you know, it'll all be available. And then shortly after that, when people have had a chance to sort of play around it and, with it and build their apps, you'll be able to just push those applications right up to the cloud. Um, so the workflow is kind of cool. You know, you sit on your own laptop, you do your development, you push the code up to the cloud, um, and it should just work exactly the same. If it doesn't, it's my fault. Sorry, um, but you know, don't envisage that. That's why we haven't done things like the video extension. We want to make sure that works. Um, but the key point from all of this is we're at a fascinating point with JavaScript as a language. We're really coming to a point where we're, we're looking at it differently. And not only us who are involved in JavaScript, but everyone is looking at it differently. Um, just the number of people who said they didn't know about this conference and wanted to be here shows how prevalent this thinking is. Um, the world is really changing. And people that have been invol involved in JavaScript for a long time are best placed to take advantage of it. Um, that's all I have for you. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer. In the meantime, thank you very much. Um, one last thing I have to do to uh, obey the Creative Commons. Um, these people deserve attribution images from Flickr. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> any questions before I hand over to? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I missed it, but is there a way to include your own libraries? That Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's an extension, but it didn't seem like a very interesting one. There is a way to pull source code from other places in the Git repository that is your, your application. Um, 
So yeah, you just use it. It pulls it into the, into the system. Eventually, we'll have a way of submitting libraries into the sort of platform library store. Not going to have that from day one, just because it, it requires more bodies and more time than I'm prepared to dedicate it to it right now. Um, but yeah. In your uh, wiki example, is the threading just single thread for each of those? So the, the question was, in the wiki example, is the threading just single threading? Um, yes, from the purpose of any given request. Um, with the asynchronous work queues, if you wanted to do other stuff, you could spin it out. Right. But what you got to remember is for that application, there could be one or a thousand machines running it. And it, so you, ha you have multi-threading by transaction, if you like. Um, it's not that only one visitor can be serviced at a time. Um, yeah. Threading is kind of a icky topic in JavaScript. Uh, Brendan Eich. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Pretty sure it is. Um, had a pretty good rant about how threading over my dead body. Um, and I tend to agree with him. Asynchronous work queues just tend to work a lot better than, than threading in a server application. Also, oh. Oh. No, go ahead. Let's, let's, I'll get you and then one at the back. So the time frame was interesting to me about your analogy for electricity and then monetization of the actual machine. Mm -hmm. Is the time for, because the, the rate of change, by any chance, do you know the difference? Like, how long did it take for the commoditization of electricity versus commoditization of machines? It seemed like it'd be much shorter. So, so the question was, how long did it take um, to, with the commoditization of electricity, wh how is that analogous to the time frame that we've seen for the commoditization of servers? And Actually, if you think about it, I think 1881 was Godalming, the first public provider, like I said. 1926 was when it was effectively commoditized. Later on, it was nationalized or monopolized. Um, but, but early on, you know, 1926 was when um, the standard emerged that made it a commodity. Um, so that's really not all. Oh, that's 40 years. Um, if you think about computing, we're not that far off 40 years um, since you know, the, the, the room in the corner with all the lab techs wearing white coats to the desktop and now to just some random provider in the cloud. We're, we're not really that far away from the same time frame. Um, although in saying that, I, wouldn't be, I, shouldn't, I also shouldn't be surprised if it was a much smaller time frame in computing. What you're seeing in industry in general with commoditization is the time for something to be a, have a you know a wow factor to being a commodity is collapsing a great deal. Look at the iPhone, you know, <laughs> when when the iPhone came out, it was only the people that waited in line. Now I think probably about 80% of the people in this room have an iPhone. Um, it's a similar commoditization. You know, when I when I first got the iPhone, I played with it for hours. It was awesome. Now I sort of like shove it in my pocket. I drop it. You know, it it's become a commodity to me. So yeah, in general, with industry, we're seeing commoditization really speed up. Um, we treat things like a commodity much, much faster. Last question at the back. Yeah, you mentioned how much uh, brain power is being expended on advancing JavaScript engines. Um, uh, did, did you mention which one you're using? Can we choose? I mean, people um, are going to be very interested in, in, in that. So yeah, the, the question is, did I, did I mention which um, JavaScript yeah. engine I'm choosing? Not explicitly, I didn't mention it. Um, we're using SpiderMonkey. And as a consequence, we're using TraceMonkey. Um, simply because, well, you know, the, we've, we've had discussions about this. You know, should we be using Rhino? It means we can use all the stuff in all the jars, blah, 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 and just embed Java stuff. The big problem with Rhino is it's not in a browser. It's not going to get the same amount of, of eyeball time that SpiderMonkey gets. And so to get those sort of benefits, we're better off. We're better off um, using SpiderMonkey than Rhino. S um, choosing SpiderMonkey over V8 or Squirrelfish, um, the, the real reason for that, I suppose, is that if you look at uh, the history of the Mozilla project, the SpiderMonkey API really hasn't changed very much. Um, it's an old, comparatively old project. You know, the, the, it has its roots in the first implementation. And the API has been pretty stable throughout. Uh, and so that gives me a confidence that it's not going to change that much. In fact, the, one of the biggest changes has been recently with the 
1.8 and all the trace monkey work that's going on, we've had to deal with more changes than, than almost ever before in its history. But I think that's a pretty compelling reason why shouldn't switch uh, to something else for this sort of stuff at the moment. I I'm not, you know, I'm not a, a language guy when it comes to the smart platform, so I don't want to spend my time, you know, rewriting code that just embeds the language. Oh, a couple more. Go with here. So you're writing, you're writing a lot of nice libraries. Any chance of opening that up? Um, absolutely. As I mentioned, everything we do in the smart platform will be open source. Um, so they will be absolutely opened up, no doubt. So I think my question is related. I, I was curious, some of the scaling um, tactics that you guys use, is the release going to you know, let the developer take advantage of some of that? Um, there will be some things which we keep as not necessarily secret sauce, but you know, um, because we're a big provider, if we go off and buy a big object database, for example, for any particular reason, of course, that's going to be closed, and the code that's going to make the decision is going to be consequently closed. Um, but you know, right, you know, out of the box, there'll be a, a local SQL Lite store, there'll be a local MySQL store, there'll be a MongoDB store that you can you know chop and change. Uh, we're, you know, we're not trying to protect our position in any way with the source code, because um, we don't see there being really a position to protect. We're competing on quality of service, not anything else. Yes? You said will a lot. When's the first, when's the date we'll be able to play um, Very soon. We actually really hoped we'd be able to announce, here's the download here. Um, we just had, some, we're just going through an internal QA, basically. And then it'll be absolutely available. Um, like I said, really wanted it here. Couldn't quite pull it off. Um, maybe next year I'll have more uh, actual, you know, visible. You can download this. Here you go. I think I'm just about out of time. Again, thank you very much. <laughs>